rectification claims, um, specifically in the context of Talata. Now, what I call my slides up, just by way of just a very brief introduction, rectification is a, it's a massive topic. I'm not going to be able to do justice to it in 25 minutes or 20 minutes over lunch hour. So what I've done is I've tried to pick out some useful little chestnuts from the area, which I think would give you some useful pointers in day-to-day -day practice when looking at Talata claims in particular. Now, in the Talata context, um, we know uh, that a properly completed and executed TR1 declaring the party's respective interest in the property is going to remain conclusive unless and until it's set aside, as Natasha's explained, whether it's rectified, as I'm about to, to look at, or whether it's varied by subsequent deed or estoppel. Now, we're revisiting the issue of estoppel in a fortnight's time when there's some further talks being given. But for today's purposes, we're going to focus on uh, now rectification. So in co-owner cases, advice will often be given or should be given in co-owner cases that it's useful for beneficial co-owners to set out their respective interests in the property so that there aren't any disputes afterwards, to record any expressed terms as between those co-owners, for example, who's going to, is, is either party going to have a right to buy uh, one party out on a sale, so an option agreement, uh, how that might work, uh, who's going to pay for the maintenance costs during the period of cohabitation, uh, what's going to happen to any income if the property's let out, and, and so on and so forth. So it's, it's good discipline to have all of that written down. Uh, and as we said, it, particularly in respect of the beneficial interests and, and a TR1. But, but what happens if that goes wrong? What happens if the well-planned and well-thought-out record of what the parties have agreed doesn't actually reflect what it is that they thought they agreed. Well, that's where rectification steps in. Now, rectification is not about rewriting the agreement. It's not about uh, renegotiating and refining terms that the parties wish they'd agreed with hindsight. Um, as Lord Justice Mummery said in Arlett and Wilding, rectification is about putting the record straight. And in the case of voluntary settlement, Rectification involves bringing the, the trust document in that case into line with the true intentions of the set law as held by him at the date when he executed the document. So that's what, that's what rectification is meant to be. Now, there are um, a couple of steps that we have to go through to get a rectification claim off the ground. Uh, firstly, you have to identify that there has been a mistake. Seems pretty obvious, really. Um, but you need to show that the document does not record what the parties thought it recorded. Secondly, you have to show what the parties actually intended. So what words did they actually intend to record in the agreement? It's not good enough just simply to show what the agreement records is not what they intended. You have to take the next step and demonstrate what it is they wanted it to show. And then thirdly, having gone through those two initial steps, you have to persuade the court that it should exercise its discretion. It is, after all, an equitable jurisdiction. And in some cases, uh, it's not going to be uh, within the court's mind to, to exercise its discretion. So let's unpack the first of those, establishing the mistake. Now, as you would expect, given that the whole purpose of a written agreement is to record what the parties intended so that if and when they fall out after the event, there can be no dispute as to what they intended because it's what's written on the paper and usually signed by them. So as you would expect in that context, the courts require pretty good evidence to show that it's not actually what they intended. And there's lots and lots of cases which use this particular expression which trips off the tongue quite nicely. The earliest expression of it I can find is a case is a case by a uh, dis decision by Lord Thurlow in the Countess of, Shel of Shelbourne, where he says that the onus of proof is on the, the plaintiff, in that case the claimant in more modern speak, and strong irrefragable evidence is required. In a case I was involved in called Oakley and Oakley in the High Court a couple of years ago, Lady Justice Asplin expanded on that strong irrefragable evidence point. And what she said is it's, it's still on the civil standard, 
And the standard of proof is, however, she said, like any other in civil proceedings, the civil standard on the balance of probabilities. But you need strong evidence to overturn what, if, what is going to be uppermost in the court's mind as to what's been recorded on the sheet of paper. And that's what's meant by strong, irrefragable evidence. And in a case called Thomas Bates and Wyndham's lingerie, Mr. Justice Brightman said, talked of the, a need for convincing proof being required in order to counteract the cogent evidence of the party's intention displayed by the instrument itself. And when you step away from the, the legalese here and you think about the practicalities, that kind of makes sense, doesn't it? Because a number of times people have hastily written documents and then after the event when parties' positions crystallise and they become more entrenched and they argue and they twist and they turn, a number of times those parties would say, well, actually, that's not really what I meant. What I meant was X, Y and Z rather than what's written down on the sheet of paper. You can see why in that context there's a, there's a fairly strong um, public policy reason why fairly strong convincing proof is required to persuade a court to depart from what's written on that sheet of paper. Now, I, I've picked on the next few slides, I've picked up on a couple of categories of rectification or do documents that would uh, be relevant to Talata claims that one might seek to rectify. Starting point, I think, would be to look at voluntary settlements. So, for example, where a parent settles a property in trust, either for themselves and their children, or for their children and their grandchildren, or whatever the scenario, but it's a voluntary settlement. One person transfers a property into a trust. How does that work? Well, um, there's a case called Re Butlin's Settlements. Uh, the settlor, Sir Billy Butlin, um, of Butlin's Holiday Park fame, executed a voluntary settlement intended to include a clause, he said, giving the majority of the trustees the power to bind the minority in the exercise of their disp dispositive powers. Now, um, one of the original trustees of the settlement was Sir Billy Butlin's wife. By the time of these proceedings, his, his ex-wife. And that will open a little window into how this dispute came about. For the prevailing 20 or so years, there'd be no problem at all in the exercise of the trustee's discretion because they all fell into line and did what they all agreed upon. And there was no problem. But by the time of the estrangement, Sir Billy Butlin's wife didn't want to agree and wouldn't agree with what the other trustees were getting up to. So, Sir Billy argued, it was always intended that there wouldn't have to be a unanimous decision on behalf of the trustees to give assets away. It would only have to be a majority decision. Now, by the very fact that I'm talking to you about this today in a rectification claims talk, you, you probably have cottoned on that that clause wasn't in the agreement. And Sir Billy Butlin's lawyers argued that by reason of a draftsman's error, that clause confirming the power on the trustee to act by majority, um, only applied in limited circumstances and ought to apply to their particular powers to dispose of assets and give assets away to family members. But an application was brought in the High Court. He sought rectification some 28 years after the execution of the settlement, 28 fairly harmonious years where the trustees had got along and exercised their powers um, or, or, uh, together and collectively without, without issue. Of the uh, original five trustees of the settlement, one, the settlor solicitor who drafted the agreement, recalled what the settlor intended, he said. Uh, and yes, it was always intended that they would act by uh, majority, simple majority, uh, rather than uh, unanimous decision making. The other trustee, one of the other trustees, his wife, now estranged wife, opposed that application. She didn't give any reasons, but she simply opposed the claim. But it raised um, a, a useful legal issue or an important legal issue, which was this. Where a settlor had transferred an asset into a trust and the trustees were to hold that asset pursuant to the terms of the trust and there was said to be a mistake such that that trust document didn't accurately record what it should record, what evidence, what intention is the court looking for? Whose mistake does it need to be? Does it need to be the mistake of the trustees who now hold the asset under the terms of the trust? Or does it need to be the mistake of the set law? And if it's the latter, and I'll let you in on a secret, it was the latter according to the court, it was the set law's intention that was important. Is it also important that those trustees are aware what that, of what that set law had actually intended? 
Well, Mr. Justice Brightman found, one, that it was the set law's intention that was important because he was gifting the asset into the trust. Uh, and secondly, um, in the absence of a, of a bargain between the trustees and the set law, such, such as a contract type case, it's not necessary for the set law to show that the settlement does not express the wishes, the true intention of the trustees. It's only really the set law's intention that the court needs to be concerned with. So that's the, the Butlin case. And there's two other cases, more recent cases that I want to touch on uh, with you, three other cases that I want to touch on with you. Um, first, these are, is a case called Day and Day from 2014, a decision of Terence Etherton in the High Court, Chancery Division, talking about voluntary settlements. Um, and Lord Justice Etherton said, well, yes, you're looking for the intentions of the set law. Uh, and yes, it's not necessary to show that the trustees knew what the set law intended. Uh, and in fact, it's not necessary, not strictly necessary to show that at the relevant time pre-settlement, the set law made an outward expression or objective communication of his true intentions. But in reality, in the absence of that, in the absence of some documentary evidence or some communication to the trustees or to the solicitors or whoever that the set law actually intended a particular form of structure that doesn't, doesn't then find its way translate into the trust documents, it's going to be nigh on impossible to prove that the set law intended something other than what's written down. So the, the two more recent examples that I'd like to talk to you about um, which, which bring that problem to life the first is a case called Oatley and Oatley. It's a case I dealt with to do with a, a large family farm in Wiltshire. In the 1980s, the Oatley family had set up two family settlements. 1995, it had been restructured into a single family fund. Now, the architect, the clever clogs behind the scheme in this instance, was a, was a tax advisor, and he'd worked out that the family would save, or it would, be, it would be advantageous for tax purposes, for the family to restructure the two settlements into, into a single fund. So that's, what he, that's what he advised. The builder of the scheme, as I've described him, was a solicitor who was pulling it all together. Um, and the solicitor was, it's fair to say, reasonably inexperienced and certainly didn't understand the nuances of what the architect, the, 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 the tax advisor, had intended. And the solicitor, when drawing up the scheme, had misunderstood his instructions and misunderstood the effect of what he's doing, what he was doing. Now, it, important in that case was that the Oatley family had a successful family business. Uh, successful family farms, and they all operated from uh, land that was in the 1985 settlements. There were also a number of family houses, which were also in the 1985 settlements, which were lived in by the sons of the Oakley family. And the, the Oakley family sons were the people who were doing the work, running the business, making the money, making it all tick over. So, unfortunately, in the, in the restructured settlement in 1995, the sons, the Oatley sons, were named as set laws of those, those new settlements, and they were excluded from the class of beneficiaries of the new fund. Now, that was pretty important and, and of pretty great significance in this case, because they lived in the properties that were owned by the settlement. Uh, they worked in the, in the businesses that, that operated from the land that was owned by the settlement. And really, if they had no right to benefit from it, there was no reason for them to continue with those efforts, and there was a risk that they would be made homeless, and it really couldn't have been in the settlers' intention to do this. Whereas, in contrast, their children and their wives and their ex-wives, importantly, remained within the class of beneficiaries. Now, there was not a great deal of evidence available as to what the settlers intended when those trusts were created. All they really wanted to do was what their tax advisor told them. That was the, the thrust of the evidence. Um, but the court was prepared to proceed, <coughs> excuse me, on the basis that they had a general overarching intention to restructure the scheme. They generally didn't wish to exclude their sons. And even though they didn't really understand the ins and outs of what was going on, they pretty much said, well, let's do what the tax advisor is telling us. So in that case, the court was prepared to accept on what seemed to be relatively flimsy evidence that the set law's intentions weren't carried into effect and relief was granted. The trust funds were redrafted and the sons were brought within the category of beneficiaries. Um, the last case I want to talk to you about in respect of um, settlement rectification, um, it's a case called Miller and Miller. Again, this is not a, it's not meant to be a list of all cases that I've been involved with recently, but it just, it's two cases which are relevant to rectification of settlements. Um, this is a decision from 2018, decided by His Honour Judge Matthews here in Bristol, 
um, fairly standard arrangement. Um, parents um, owned a family property. Um, one of the parents died, I think it was the mother who died. She left her share to her children and her children decided to resettle their half share in the matrimonial home back into trust to allow dad to live in the house and then on his death to come back to them. That's what they wanted to do, but that's not what happened. Um, they, they set up a lifetime trust in 2005, settled their mother's half share of the property, which had been left to them into the trust. The life interest trust was created for their father. And after his death, it was said then passed back to them. And clause five of the trust contained a power to appoint capital to one or more, capital to one or more of the father, settlers, their spouse or their children. So on the face of it, it all looked pretty hunky-dory and, and what was intended. However, um, clause 13 of the trust uh, documents specifically excluded the settlers and their spouses from any benefit from the trust instrument. Now, the reason why that happened was that the uh, solicitors who prepared the documents were relatively inexperienced. What they seem to have done seem to have done was effectively splice two precedents together without properly understanding how they would how they would work together. And clause 13 had the effect of excluding the claimants from any benefit under the trust when their father died. Obvious error, pretty pretty straightforward. Um, the matter was decided by His Honour Judge Matthews in Bristol, who said, "Well, I, we, we can deal with this case in one of two ways." Firstly, on a, on a true construction, clause 13 must be read in the context of clauses four and five, which specifically uh, provide that the children should benefit. And in the alternative, he said he would rectify uh, the settlement and effectively delete clause 13. So that would have the effect of allowing the children to benefit. So that's um, rectification claims in, the res in respect of settlements. So settling, settling assets in trust by one person to another. Next and seemingly quite relevant, I think, to Talata claims is property transactions. And this gets a little complicated, so I'll just pick up what I think are the useful headline points to take away. Um, it's been, a, in the last 20 years, a flurry of decisions on rectification of um, property transactions. One of the leading cases, a case called Swainland Builders and Freehold Properties, and that's about 20 odd years old now. And in that decision um, in the Court of Appeal, Lord Justice Peter Gibson summarised four requirements for the grant of rectification in property claims. Um, firstly, the parties to a claim need to show that the parties to the transaction had a common continuing intention, whether or not amounting to an agreement in respect of a sp particular matter in the instrument to be rectified. So a common continuing intention right up to the point they signed. Secondly, there needs to be an outward expression of accord. So it's to say it. You can't just come up with it after the event. Thirdly, that intention, the intention that somehow gets lost in translation, that intention needs to continue up to and including at the time of the execution of the instrument that they're now seeking to rectify. So effectively, they can't change their mind at the last minute. They must always believe and intend to enter into an agreement on a particular basis. And then fourthly, and crucially, as a result of that mistake, that instrument ought not reflect the common intention of the parties. So continuing a common intention, an outward expression of accord, that intention to continue up to the point of execution of the agreement, and as a result of a mistake, the agreement doesn't give effect to, that, to the party's continuing common intention. So those are the, the four headline points, pretty straightforward. Now, in 2020, um, this matter came before the Court of Appeal in a case called FSHC Group Holdings and GLAS Trust Corporation in the context of contract claims. Um, I mention this case very, very briefly because it sets up quite an important case in this area that I'm going to come on to in a moment. In the FSHC case, the Court of Appeal was considering some comments made by Lord Hoffman in a case called Chartbrook and Persimmon Homes. Um, in Sharbrook and Persimmon is a fairly significant case, um, but decided or comment made obiter by Lord Hoffman was that in the context of rectification claims, the court wasn't looking for a subjective intention of the parties, the court was looking for a purely objective assessment of the party's intentions. Now, there was um, a considerable amount of pushback from that decision, both academically and in the courts afterwards, because the overwhelming body of case law before Chartbrook uh, 
was pretty clear that the court should be looking for the party's subjective intentions. What do they actually intend in entering into this agreement? Not what do you think objectively they thought in entering into the agreement? So Hoffman said in a sort of a off the cuff comment, well, it's the objective intention the court's looking for. That's to say what a reasonable observer with knowledge of the background facts and prior communication between the parties would have thought their common intention at the time of contracting was. Now, um, in FSHC group, they said, well, that's, that's not right. That's not what the court is looking for at all. Um, the court's looking for the actual common intention of the parties in entering into the contract. What do they actually intend the agreement to say? And just we, we, I'll read out this quote very quickly and then I'll move on to a case to deal with TR1s, which shows a very practical application of this particular problem. Um, Lord Justice Leggett said, it's necessary to show in, in rectification claims either that the document fails to give effect to a prior concluded contract or that when they executed the document, the parties had a common intention in respect of a particular matter, which by mistake, the document did not accurately record. In the latter case, it is necessary to show not only that each party to the contract had the same actual intention with regard to the relevant matter, but also that there was an outward expression of accord, meaning that as a result of communication between them, the parties understood each other to share that intention. So what did they subjectively intend the contract to say? So that brings us on to TR1 forms, which is probably the most relevant part of this talk to the, to the typical Talata dispute. In 2020, well, in 2021, um, there was a decision in the uh, Court of Appeal in a case called Ralph and Ralph. Context here was uh, father and son bought a property in, in 2000. Uh, father had several children, I think he had five children, of which Dean was, was one, and he had a partner. Um, father, David, was putting all of the money into the transaction, but he just didn't have the, the income to support a mortgage application. So Dean came on the mortgage, on the title with him, um, basically to support the, support the financing of the purchase, but he didn't put any money into the transaction. And as a matter of fact, he didn't actually make any payments towards the mortgage either. Now, um, in the course of the conveyancing process, the solicitors acted for both parties, uh, both the uh, same solicitors acted for David and Dean. They prepared the TR1 form, ticked box 11, to record that they held the property as 50-50 tenants in common. Thought no more of it. Number of years passed, um, family fell out, and Dean uh, sought a declaration that he had a 50% beneficial interest in the property. David said at trial, well, no, that was never my intention at all. I was never looking to give Dean half of the interest in the property. I just wanted him on the title so that I could get a mortgage. That was that. I had five children. I had a partner. I wanted to keep the whole property for all of them, of which Dean would have been one. At trial, the judge accepted David's evidence and made a finding of fact that there was no agreement to hold the property in that way. Now, crucially, that was the finding of fact, that there was no agreement to hold the property in that way. Judge found that box 11 was ticked in error and it did not represent the true and enduring intention of the parties. A rectification was ordered. Um, the court then went on to decide beneficial interest on standard Stack and Dowd and Jones and Kernan principles. Now, understandably, um, Dean wasn't terribly happy with this because he came away with an, something considerably less than 50% beneficial interest in the property. So he appealed and he said, well, there's no basis for rectification here. It's not made out. I should be entitled to my 50% share. First appeal came before Mr. Justice Morris, who upheld the original trial judge's decision and dismissed the appeal. The second appeal came to the Court of Appeal before Lord Justice Voss, um, who commented on the FSHC uh, case, who the party said was relevant and was binding case law, despite it being a contractual claim and not a property claim. And Geoffrey Voss said, well, I'm, I'm skeptical as to whether that applies, but I don't need to make a decision as to that. Um, although he did note that the trial judge had not made a fact, not made a positive finding of fact that the parties had a subjective common agreement between them at any one time as to how to hold the property. That the most that the trial judge had done was to find that David and Dean had not reached an agreement that the property should be shared in equal shares. 
it was, um, Jeffrey Voss said, it was impossible to find a sufficient or any continuing common intention that, should be, that there should be no declaration of trust in the TR1. So what Jeffrey Voss said was, well, yeah, there was a mistake. They, they didn't intend to hold it like this, but there'd be no findings of fact as to what they actually intended. And he reminded um, himself and, and the court that the law does not make contracts for people unless they have, in the way explained in the FSHC case, agreed to them themselves effectively or shown a continuing common intention as to the term or terms in issue. So the appeal was upheld and rectification, rectification in that claim was dismissed. That seems to me on the, on the face of it, a fairly harsh, harsh decision because as a finding of fact, the court found while well, the parties didn't intend to tick box 11 and didn't intend to share the property in that way, but because a finding of fact had not been made, they intended to hold it in a particularly, in a different way, uh, the rectification was refused. So I suppose there's quite a useful practice point there to all the litigators uh, listening into this talk, that if at trial, you're looking to rectify a TR1 and you're looking to uh, remove um, as the parties in Ralph did, remove a declaration of trust, you need to invite the court and lead evidence to the effect as to what the party's actual intentions were, continuing up to the point that the contract was executed. So that's Ralph and Ralph. Um, I've looked at already step two, evidencing what words act the parties actually intended and proving it. Um, and I've touched on already step three, which is that this is an equitable jurisdiction and the court will only exercise its discretion in, in the right circumstances. Useful authorities, a case called Whiteside and Whiteside, Whiteside, and Whiteside a decision of um, Mr. Justice Evershed, who said that rectification must be cautiously watched and jealously exercised, um, that there should be strong and convincing evidences required to prove a settlor's intention. So the headline is that we have a, an equitable remedy equitable principles will apply. So the parties who delay, as Natasha touched upon earlier on, uh, will fail. Parties need to come with clean hands and parties need to persuade the court that rectification, this extraordinary jurisdiction should be exercised and rectification granted. Um, in the last couple of minutes available, I'm going to touch upon um, a couple of other very, very quick points, which are, I think, academically quite useful and do have some practical import too. Um, there is, in particular, in the settlement cases, so not so much in the TR1 cases, but, it, but in the settlement of assets into trusts or deeds of variation, redirecting assets between family members, an interesting discussion as to um, the dichotomy between the effect of a transaction and the consequence of a transaction. And the cases say, Alnut and Wilding that I touched upon earlier is a particular example, that where the parties effectively closed their mind to something and then worked out afterwards that the consequences of what they did are not really what they wanted, the court isn't going to grant rectification. Whereas if the parties sign up to an agreement and the effect of that agreement is not really what they intended, then rectification is open to them. Let me try and explain a little bit what that means. Um, in um, Gibbon and Mitchell, Lord Justice Millet described it this way, um, where there's a vol voluntary transaction by one party that intends to confer a bounty on another, the deed will be set aside or rectified if the court is satisfied that the disponer did not intend the transaction to have the effect which it did. It will be set aside for mistake, whether the mistake is a mistake of law or fact, so long as the mistake is to the effect the transaction itself and not merely as the consequences or advantages to be gained by entering into it. Now, sp specifically in these sorts of cases, examples are tax consequences. So if, um, if an outcome of a transaction is that a party is included that shouldn't have been or excluded that shouldn't have been, so like Oakley and Oakley and Miller and Miller, or a case called Remain and Remain that I've talked about here, the party's in a trust or out of a trust when the reverse should have been true and that's manifestly the case, the court's likely to rectify. But where the court, even if there are tax consequences, because the, the effect of adding a party or excluding a party is not what the party's intended, but in Arnott and Wilding, for example, a settlor intended to make a potentially exempt transfer to some trustees, but the way in which it was structured, they basically made a hash of it and it didn't have the intended effect. The sole purpose of the transaction was to reduce the IHT on the settlor's death, even though 
asset had been given away, it was a farmhouse and some farmland, the way in which it had been done resulted in or meant that the party didn't have the benefit of it being a potentially exempt transfer. The revenue popped up some seven years after the transaction and said, ha ha ha, you haven't done what you should have done. You therefore do not have the tax advantage you thought you did. So rather than re, uh, restarting the transaction because the assets had been given away the, and time had been lost, parties made an application to court to rectify the, stru the structure of the deal rather than the, rather than the effect of the deal. And what um, the Court of Appeal, well, first instance, um, Colin Reimer dismissed it and said, you've got exactly what you wanted. The transaction was to give away assets, and that's what you did. The structure of it, as a result of the drafting, meant that there were unintended consequences. You didn't get tax advantages, but the effect of the transaction is precisely what you wanted. So a rectification was refused. And in the Court of Appeal, um, Reimer's decision was upheld, um, and Mummery mm. explained the position this way. Um, in brief, the position in this case is as follows. The set law had no more than a general intention, well understandable, to save inheritance tax on his death, but without making direct gifts to his children. He had a general intention to benefit them through the medium of a settlement, which, in combination with the pet, he hoped would result in mitigation of inheritance tax on his death. The trustees were totally unable to point to any more specific intentions on the part of the set law, which, owing to a mistake made in the recording of his intention and the drafting of the settlement were not recorded uh, in it or were misrecorded and could be rectified by decree of the court. In my judgment, the judge was correct both in the law and the evidence before him to reject the claim for rectification. So the transaction did what they wanted, but it didn't save the tax that they intended. And that was a consequence and not effect, an effect of the mistake. So rectification there was refused. And then just drawing the strands to a close, um, just a couple of points that I think are quite useful to have in mind. Um, in trusts cases, it's very tempting to immediately jump to a rectification claim if you think the document doesn't say what you want it to say. But it's always useful to review the, the trust structure to see whether or not there are powers in there, which mean that you can either uh, achieve the end that you wanted to achieve anyway by another means, or you can redirect the assets uh, and avoid the consequences that you were looking to avoid. Typically, if the trust contains um, powers to the trustees, wide enough powers to the trustees, these might be able to be used to either add beneficiaries to the trust or remove beneficiaries to the trust, or to appoint assets out or to change the structure on which assets are held. And that might be enough to avoid the need of having to come to the court for a, and, and seek a rectification claim. In the case of wills, which I haven't really touched upon today, um, if within two years of the date of death there's a mistake identified in a will, then you can consider making a deed of variation. Uh, and if you have made a deed of variation and there's been a hash made of that, then you can apply at that stage to rectify that document. And then finally, um, if I can just um, outline a couple of quick procedural points and then I'll open the floor to some questions. These claims typically are brought by way of a Part A claim form and a witness statement or affidavit in support. Claimant seeking rectification needs to join all relevant and interested parties to the document as defendants to the claim. Now, that's not to say that you can't bring rectification claims in any other structure. Um, if, for instance, you're a party to a Talata claim, there's no reason why you can't seek rectification in the alternative. And indeed, I have on behalf of cohabitees where my client was defending a claim um, for an order for sale. Uh, we sought rectification of a trust instrument, um, which had not accurately recorded the terms of an option agreement that the parties had entered into, and we were successful in securing that. So there's, there's a number of ways in, in which you, you can do it. Um, in, in the case of slightly more complicated um, and um, st trust tr structures, where there are minor or, or, or unborn beneficiaries to the trust, and they, those interests need to be joined, and that can either be what they way of a representative beneficiary or by um, joining the class in, in total if, it, if it's a closed class. Um, and a last word on that dreaded issue of tax. If um, there are going to be tax consequences to the change of the structure of the trust, um, then it's not possible to join the revenue without their consent. Invariably, they will not want to be joined. Typically, what you do is you write to them and say, well, this family trust doesn't say what we say it should say. 
we're going to make an application for rectification of the trust structure. Do you wish to be joined? They will write back usually and say, no, thank you. We don't wish to be joined, but we do want you to refer to the following authorities and they'll invite you to list, they'll provide a list of authorities that they will want you to put before the court. And usually it's Arnott and Wilding, which is emphasizing this dichotomy between effect and consequence in tax relevant cases. Uh, and then finally, um, any final order that you get, if there is going to be a tax consequence of the, of the rearranging of the trust, um, should record that you've at least given the revenue the opportunity to be joined in. The last thing you want to do is to put right mistakes that have been made in, the, in, the, in a trust structure, save all these problems from tax, and then for it only to be raised by the revenue in 10, 20, 30 years, that things weren't done properly, they weren't given notice, and that they're somehow not bound by the court's order for rectification. So those are a couple of, um, I hope, useful pointers to take into account in specific uh, trust rectification claims. So that is the end of my talk. And if anyone has any questions, please put them in the chat and Natasha and I will do our level best to address them for you. It doesn't seem to be an avalanche of questions. Now, whether that's because everybody's already left and is bored to tears or we've addressed everything, I'm not entirely sure. Um, but we'll hang on the line for another 30 seconds, 60 seconds or so. And if anybody does want to ask any questions, please drop them in the chat. Um, if not, you probably have our email addresses. Please do feel free to reach out and drop us an email if anything's not clear or you'd like to run anything by us. We would be interested. Um, I could remind you that we do have feedback forms. If you could fill those out and return them to, um, to the admin team, that would be wonderful. The marketing team, that would be wonderful. We do really enjoy giving these seminars and we're really grateful for everyone joining, um, but the feedback is very, very important to us because it allows us to tailor our talks um, to what you want. And if there are any particular areas that you'd like us to speak on, please do say and we can, um, we can take that into account next time. Two questions have popped up. Um, I've been asked whether the slides will be available at a later date. Yes, they absolutely will be. And if they haven't already been emailed out, they will be emailed out to you. So I think, folks, that's probably it. Well, thank you again for joining us, and we will see you in a fortnight for the next talk, which is proprietary estoppel claims. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>